begin then, uh, we'll do this uh, brief analysis of uh, the training error for boosting. Right? And last time I had just presented the algorithm to you, shown a little bit how it works with a simple example. And uh, it involves sort of picking this. Uh, so first of all, what are we doing in boosting? We have a bunch of weak learners. And we are combining them by relearning a weak learner on weighted training data. Right? So we said, we'll take all our weights, initialize them to be equal. And then at the next iteration, we, are, we learn a weak learner on it. And whichever uh, training errors uh, are not classified properly, we increase their weights. And we decrease the weights of the training examples for which we do get the label right. right? And then we go on uh, and uh, relearn a hypothesis on this new weighted training data set. There was one thing that came in there, which was uh, the weight that we give alpha t to each weak hypothesis that we learn. So at the tth iteration, if we learn a weak hypothesis ht, then we let it vote with certain weight alpha t in the final predictor, because the final predictor was just a combination of all these classifiers with the corresponding weights, summing that up and taking its sign. Right? So how did we arrive at this magic uh, value for the weight for each classifier? And you'll see it depends on the training error on the weighted data set that that particular hypothesis achieves. Okay, so all of this will pop out nicely when we do the analysis of the training error of boosting. Okay, so this, and then we had this other, um, so this will be actually the bound that we'll prove today quickly. So this is just the training error. So we have m training data points, xi with labels yi. Capital H is our final predictor based off of a linear combination of all the weighted hypotheses we learned, right? Uh, so each hypothesis multiplied by its weight. And this is the sign of that. So that's our final classifier. How many errors it makes on the training data, that's this. And we'll upper bound it with something like this. Uh, this bound was interesting, as we talked about earlier, because it's saying that as long as each, the performance of each hypothesis, epsilon t is the performance of the hypothesis ht at the tth round, right? So as long as each of them is slightly better than random guessing, so its performance, its error is slightly better than half, we get an exponential decrease in the training error as the number of training rounds goes to infinity, the capital T. So that's why such a bound will be of interest. Okay? And uh, the reason uh, we should uh, look at this is, one, we'll get both of these results. We'll show a bound of this nature. The update rule for alpha, why we set it this way, will pop out. And you'll see that actually what boosting is really going after is a different loss function. Right? So maybe I should uh, start by first reminding you that the loss function we have cared about so far we talked about a few, but at least uh, here's one. There's a 0, 1 loss function, which um, if you get the label correctly, uh, if you get it incorrectly, it's 1. If you get it correctly, it's 0. So that's one way to think of the 0, 1 loss function. Right? Uh, you can think about other loss functions we've talked about, like the hinge loss. So the hinge loss looks something like this, that only if you have, you get the label correct up to a certain margin, you say that there's essentially no error, right? But beyond, below that, you get an error. So this would be the hinge loss, right? And uh, you can actually think of the loss that logistic regression is optimizing. We haven't talked about that, but that's food for thought. And maybe it looks something like this. So there is a, what we call log loss associated with logistic regression. And there's going to be another one for exponential loss. Again, uh, my drawing skills are not great, so I may not get it exactly right. But it's going to look something like the log loss, slightly different. Okay? But the point of all of these is, so we are optimizing these different loss functions. We really care about the 0, 1 loss, but that's hard to optimize in practice, because it's a non-convex loss. As you can see, it's a step function. right? This, it's not a nice convex function. So all of these other losses, whether it be the hinge loss, the log loss, or the exponential loss, they're all upper bounds on this 0, 1 loss function. Okay? And uh, that's why uh, different algorithms go after these, because they're easier to optimize. But of course, if you care about misclassification rate, you are just using possibly a weak, loose upper bound on it. Right? But they will tend to work well. So boosting uses the exponential loss. And this is how it looks like. So here's our training error of the final classifier. right? So remember, the final classifier is capital H, which is a sign of a linear combination. It's a sign of fx, where fx is just the linear combination of all the hypotheses we have learned so far, weighted by their weights. 
So we take this training error and what uh, Boosting tries to do is actually minimize an upper bound on it. Here's what the upper bound looks like. And it's the exponential, it's just instead of saying one, whether the label is right or not, you're doing e to the negative, whether y and f have the same sign essentially or not, right? You're measuring that. So that's, you've seen y i times f of x i appear in the definition of the margin as well, right? So we are taking the same quantity, looking at uh, f of x, you can think of it as sort of the predicted label except for the sign, right? So it's like the margin and you're multiplying it with the label and you're just seeing how large that product is. So this is, as I said, another upper bound here, it looks kind of like the log, slightly different. And that's what boosting goes after. All right, so let's, uh, oh, actually, I think I have a picture of that. I didn't need to draw it. I forgot I had it. <laughs> so anyway, this is just, again, to show that here's how the 0, 1 loss would have looked like. And uh, this is how the exponential loss is an upper bound on it. And uh, yeah, if, if we can make the upper bound go to 0, then clearly your training error will also go to 0, right? So it suffices to prove an upper bound on the exponential loss. It will give us a bound on the training loss. All right, so uh, to derive that, uh, an upper bound on our bounding this quantity, first of all, we can begin by looking at the fact that this quantity can just be written as the product of a bunch of variables called zetas, which are over the different rounds, t. Okay? And the way to see that is actually this zt is going to be exactly the partition function. I don't know if you remember. There was a normalizing factor we had used to make sure all the weights sum to 1. This is going to be exactly that. And we can see it fairly quickly. So here's our original weights. So all you have to do is keep track of our weights, how they look like. So initial weights for each of the data points were just 1 over m, uniform weight for all the points. At the next step, we updated the weights by taking whatever were the previous weights, in this, this case 1 over m, and multiplying it with e to the minus alpha t, which is alpha 1 now, after the first round, yi h1 xi, right? That's just our update rule. If the signs of y and h match, then you're reducing the weight. If they don't match, you're increasing the weight. And z1 was the corresponding normalization factor, which ensures all of the d2i sum to 1, right? And let's just keep on doing this. So all we are doing is rewriting the weights at every iteration. So d3i would be d2i times an exponential like that. I'm just writing it out explicitly here. Right? So if you look at the weight update equation in our, uh, the training weight update equation in boosting, all we are doing is just writing it out in a cascading form. Right? So you can go on doing that. You can write it all the way up to what are the weights after t rounds of running boosting. right? And you will see that all that will happen is it's 1 by m, which were the initial weights, times a bunch of e to the negative terms, right? So it's uh, all of these terms, if you pull them together, become e to the minus yi. yi is common to all the exponential terms. And then you just get sum of alphas and h's, right? Are people following this? Or, um, I know it's a bunch of math. but. Uh, so all you end up with is, because you're multiplying a bunch of exponentials, you get the sum in the uh, exponent, right? And you get a sum of alpha t h t's, which is just the f, right? So we get here the f of x i's. So that's what the exponential term reduces to. And in the bottom, we are just multiplying all of the partition, all of these uh, normalizing factors together, right? So we get product t z t, right? And the last step is realizing that at every stage, these weights have to sum to 1, right? So if I say that here's an expression for the weights after t rounds of running boosting, and they all have to sum to 1, if I do sum over i of this and equate it to 1, you can already see that what is popping out here is the exponential loss, right? Our exponential loss is 1 by m sum e to the minus y f x i. So all I get is when I sum this over all i, I get the boosting exponential loss divided by product tzt. Right? And we can equate that to 1. And that gives us this result right here. That we, the exponential loss function, we can rewrite as the product over each iteration of this z variable. Right? So why is this interesting? Because it, now it's saying, now we have something which can be written as the product over each iteration. So we can see that as more and more iterations go on, provided zt is less than 1, we are going to converge, right? 
we are just multiplying something that's very very small less than one many many times. So what's going if zt is less than one you can see that the training error is going to decrease exponentially right because you're just multiplying it over all of these iterations. And even though each weak learner may not be good overall you get that your er overall training error goes to zero. Right. And actually once we have written it in this form now we can actually think of it as what we are trying to do is we are picking a hypothesis and we are picking its weight at each iteration and they are chosen such that you minimize this upper bound which we have shown is equal to product tzt. So one way to do this is you think of it as at it each iteration we are picking a ht and alpha t its weight to minimize zt. We are essentially doing uh, if you want to think of it as coordinate descent kind of procedure where every iteration we pick the hypothesis and the weight to minimize the value of this z which is really what is relevant to the uh, up uh, to our uh, loss function at each iteration t. All right. So uh, that is exactly how we will get the alpha t corresponding to hypothesis. So we are going to minimize this right to minimize our training error and we can tighten it uh, we can do this greedily by every at every iteration choosing the weight and the hypothesis which minimizes zt right because our loss is just a product over all of these variables at each iteration. All right so let us do that. So we will write out our zt and we will minimize it over alpha t right assuming a fixed ht. Right. So here is our zt let us find out what the right alpha t should be which minimizes this right and if we greedily pick such alpha t's then in the end we are minimizing our product over t z t's right. All right so we can work this out and it will exactly turn to be this expression. So let us try to do it um, in fact I think I have it most of it written up because I was like in case we do not get to do it you can read through the slides. So uh, notice that an easy way to optimize it so we are we're trying to minimize this expression with respect to alpha t right. You can directly take the derivative with respect to alpha t but it will help to actually write it out in the following way. So we have sum over all of the training data points we can split it into points that we get correctly uh, that are correctly classified and the ones that are not correctly classified right. So the first term here is all points for which we do not get the label right using the current hypothesis ht and these are all the points for which we do get the label right. So for the ones for which we do not get the label right you can see that this expression is just dt of i times e to the alpha t right because it means that y and h do not agree. So if one is plus one the other is minus one right so the, their product is minus one that is why we just get e to the alpha t here and for the ones in for which they agree if y i if the label is plus one h t also says plus one or if the label is minus one it uh, h t also says minus one. So their product is always positive one and so we get e to the minus alpha t here right so we have a much simpler expression. And um, now all you have to do is to observe that the e to the alpha t or e to the minus alpha t we can pull out of the sums right they do not depend on i. So we can do that we pull out e to the alpha t from the first one what we are left with is just counting the weights of points for which we do not get the label right right and that is exactly epsilon t that is our weighted training error. Right, it is the all the points on which we made an error and what was their weight we are just summing it up. So that is just the weighted training error right there. So that times e to the alpha t is what we get for the first one for the second one we can see that again all the weights have to sum to 1 so it is just 1 minus the weighted training error once we have pull, pulled out e to the minus alpha t. Okay. All right so now we have a very very simple expression and we can take its derivative with respect to alpha t to find for what setting of the weight for each hypothesis do we minimize zt right. So let us do that we can take the derivative of zt this expression that the simpler expression we have derived with respect to alpha t and notice that once we have fixed a hypothesis we have chosen a weak learner its training error is fixed right it is weighted training error that is why we can treat epsilon t as a constant 
in picking the alpha t. So, we take the derivative of the first term that is exactly the same right e to the a if you take derivative with respect to a is same. For the second term we get again just the negative of that. We set this equal to 0 and we have our alpha t. So, you can already see when we set it equal to 0 what do we get? We will get something like we move this to the other side we get 1 minus epsilon t over epsilon t right that is equal to e to the 2 alpha t right. So, just moving things around just simplifying this equation right equal to 0 we have that and you can take the natural log on both sides and you end up with the final weight. Right. Any questions on this? It is fairly simple math. But so, all we did was we said well the training error can be uh, it can be upper bounded by the exponential error right the exponential loss function evaluated on our training data points boosting is going to minimize this exponential loss and we saw that once we write that exponential loss as the product over each iteration each round of boosting of the corresponding um, zt variable then all we can do is greedily optimize zt at every iteration that's what boosting does at each step pick the weight for the hypothesis alpha t that minimizes zt and we did its derivation and out pops out this expression for the weight uh, that we had talked about earlier. So, you can look at the math on your own if uh, any of this was it is fairly simple, but really that is what we went ahead and uh, did. And what we can do is now go back we can plug in alpha t evaluate what is the z t at the, the at this setting of alpha t and that will give us an upper bound on our training error right. So, let us do that. So, we are going to take our alpha t which we derive to be this right the optimal setting we will plug it in here in the expression for z t and that will give us an upper bound uh, or that will give us an exact expression so far for uh, z t, but uh, then we can put it into the bound right. So, uh, we have to substitute for e to the alpha t here and e to the minus alpha t over here right. Uh, we can do that because actually we do not even have to refer back to this we already have e to the 2 alpha t expression over here right. So, we can do this fairly quickly. So, what we will do is we are evaluating now z t when alpha t is set to half log 1 minus epsilon t over epsilon t right. So, let us do that we get z t is epsilon t and then e to the alpha t from there is just square root of right that just holds because we derived e to the 2 alpha t to be this and then we have 1 minus epsilon t and you get the inverse of that right. And that is how you end up with just twice square root epsilon t times 1 minus epsilon t right. So, this is a, exa an exact expression given that your uh, weighted training error for hypothesis h t was epsilon t. Now, you have an exact expression for once you have set alpha t this way you have an exact expression for z t right and the product of all these z t's is going to be your exponential loss. So, uh, this is just a little trick you can do to rewrite this in this form and the reason it is helpful is you can already see now what will pop out is how far epsilon t is from half right that was one of the results in our uh, upper bound that as long as each hypothesis its weighted error epsilon t is slightly better than random guessing which is half boosting is supposed to do well. So, that that just pops out from here once we write it this way all right. So, what we have shown so far is we can take the training error of boosting bounded by the exponential loss which is just can be rewritten, rewritten as product t z t's and we have expression for z t with the right setting of alpha t which looks like this right. And um, now, we do a simple trick where we can re replace the product over t by e to the negative sum of that quantity ok. So, that is an expression which holds because you get you essentially what you are doing is you are taking 1 minus x and replacing it with e to the minus x. So, once we do that over here 
right? You will see that we arrive at an expression like this, which is exactly the bound we had earlier, which tells us how far each, as long as each hypothesis, its error is slightly better than half, then we have this exponential decay in the training error. So it tells you that it can start with very, very simple learners, but as the rounds of boosting go on, your uh, classifier is actually becoming much more complex and it can get you zero training error no matter what your training data set is, right? So it can exactly classify your training data set, right? That's the upshot of it. All right, so the key here is still we have shown a bound and we have shown you know, what in spirit ex, uh, boosting is doing. It's minimizing this, this exponential loss, but everything is about training error. And we already know that if we are minimizing training error, then our classifier is probably doing overfitting, right? So this proof, I think you should just take it to mean that it shows you one, what is the underlying spirit behind boosting, and two, it says that the, even though we start with very simple classifiers, we do get a complicated classifier at the end. But of course, we are talking about training error, so it can still overfit, right? It may be, because we have only shown that the training error goes to zero, not the test error. So um, what about the test error? So people, uh, of course, when it was, uh, people came up with this idea, this algorithm, even though it involved all this nice math to uh, show uh, how it was motivated. When you apply it to test error, you, they were expecting that you know, it will overfit as is typically the case. But here's what a sample run looks like. So this is the error of boosting versus number of rounds of boosting. So this is changing capital T. And what they saw was that usually the training error went down and so did the test error, which was quite surprising because usually when you're overfitting, you're getting zero training error, uh, your test error starts to increase, right? You have increased the complexity of your model too much. And um, it seemed like boosting was, not always, but most of the time it seemed like it was robust to overfitting. And this actually perplexed the uh, machine learners for a long time, or machine learning researchers, that somehow your test error also seemed to be going down as the training error was going down. All right, so um, just to tell you some story here, people actually did then do a more formal analysis of the test error of boosting. And they were able to show things like this. So these are sort of the bounds you will see later on in this course. We won't, of course, derive these right now. But we can say something about how far is the test or the true error given the training error of, that, uh, of a hypothesis. And you can show that the true error is no more than the training error plus some quantity. You have already seen, I think, something like this when we talked about naive Bayes and logistic regression. And when people did this kind of bounds, well, you see that as the the capital T, which is the number of rounds of boosting, pops up. And in fact, it is saying that your test, if your capital T is much larger. In particular, if you let boosting uh, go on, so T goes to infinity, then you are getting a very, very large. It should be uh, overfitting. And this is exactly another way to think of this is you can think of it as the training error sort of been reflecting your bias. So when t is small, your training error is large, right? You haven't minimized it yet because you haven't done enough rounds. But your variance is small because, again, the t pops up here, right? And uh, when t is large, we just showed that the training error goes down exponentially. But this term is telling us that the second term, which is sort of like the variance, is large. So our overall test error should, uh, should be increasing. And again, to be specific here, the other things are, so T is the number of rounds of boosting, M is the number of data points. Clearly, the more data points you have, the closer you expect the training and test error to be, so it makes sense. And D is, again, something which we'll talk about later. It's specifically the VC dimension that we'll get to later on in the course, but it's just measuring complexity of your base classifier. So boosting uses some simple classifiers, right? And they have a certain complexity, which is D. So clearly, as if you are trying to boost a simple learner, then you expect the training and the test error to be close. But if you're starting with something very complicated and trying to boost that over iterations, you get a bad error, right? So that's why when you're doing boosting, you should be using something very simple, like say a decision tree with just one split, which are called decision stumps. 
you should not be taking an entire decision tree that you've learned on the data and then try to boost it, right? Because that increases the complexity of your base classifier. Uh, so as you use a more complicated classifier, you're saying yeah, yeah, the training error should also yeah. go down. Yeah, that is true, right? And that helps. Um, so what I've what I've heard people say is that um, you want to take sort of the minimal complexity of classifier such that the weak learners actually always succeed, right? So if you take there are situations where if you take too simple a weak learner, you're gonna to get to the situation where you're not actually gonna do any better than chance even on the training data, right? And, there, and then boosting will get stuck. So in that situation, you definitely want to increase the complexity of your weak learner. But then there's this sort of um, short step size type thing where you wanna make the, you wanna, you want to not increase the complexity too fast because you want each round to sort of, like you want to take into account the information you get by reweighting the hypotheses after each round, right? And not take too big a step. So, so right. here, this only shows that second effect that you don't want to take too big a step. But the first effect is hidden in the fact that each weak learner has to get, you know, uh, at least epsilon better than a half in order to make progress. And if that doesn't happen, then you can get stopped. And actually, I think the next uh, thing which talks about, so initially people showed bounds of this form, and later on they showed bounds which depended on the marginal analysis, and there this fact actually pops up, that if you use, it, here it's saying that yeah, uh, boosting should overfit, right? So you should pay a price for using a very complicated learner. Even there you have it, it's just smaller. So I think uh, I have it somewhere. Okay, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, there's another bound of the uh, you can show, but at least this type of bound was sort of contradicting the experimental results because it said that well, boosting should overfit as you increase t, right? Your test and training error should be very different. But um, then it turned out people did another analysis, which instead of doing bounds in terms of this VC dimension um, or this this particular form of bounds, they used what are called margin-based bounds, and then they were able to show. Of course, the VC dimension is still there. But what they were able to show is that the dependence on t, the number of rounds of boosting, kind of goes away. And you can alternatively show a bound like this, which says that your true error depends on what's the margin that can be achieved by using a particular set of classifiers, which could be very complicated. So you can achieve a, maybe a smaller margin. But if you choose the complexity too high, then you will pay a price here, because you won't be able to uh, choose a, a small margin. And now you have something which only depends on that margin. So theta is a bound on the margin. But the t, the number of rounds of boosting, has disappeared now. So essentially what it's saying is that one way to think of what boosting is doing, the reason it's a little bit uh, robust, is as you increase the number of rounds, your overall classifier may not be getting as complex. You're doing more and more rounds, so it keeps changing a little bit. But your overall uh, classifier is not getting too complex. And the reason is because boosting is focusing, giving more weight to some than the others. So it's aggressively focusing on the hardest examples. And once you found those, your underlying classifier is not. So it's not getting way too complicated as t increases. And that's why, at least to some extent, provided you're not using very, very complicated learners, your performance in practice often, actually, the test error also kept going down. Because you're adding more and more simple learners, but they're not very different because now you have given a lot of weight to the hard hardest examples already, and you're just relearning on those in some sense. So this is what this margin-based analysis of boosting sort of pointed to. That it could be one possible explanation for why, because this bound does not have capital T anywhere, the number of rounds of boosting, and all that matters is what's the margin that can be achieved using your uh, class, which depends on which, what are the weak learners you're using, essentially. So it only depends on what margin is there in your data that, uh, that boosting can get after, but 
as it goes on training more and more, it's not going to change the final hypothesis as much. Right. So it can still overfit, but only if you would use weak learners that are too complex, or if your data is actually not very separable anyways. Right. All right, so here are some more experiments that people did. And now you can see that uh, they were able to see this effect, that a lot of them, so what you should look at here is a bunch of training and test sets and different data sets. And then there are two columns of it. So there is a training and test pair for four or five, I guess, five different data sets here, and another five different data sets, again, training and test. Okay, So just so you understand the curves. Um, and uh, what the curves are showing is that, as you can see, the training error goes down for this data set. The test error also goes down. And that happens for many of those. Training goes down, test goes down, training test. Many of these, it goes down. And the, but then there are some for which it starts to increase. Right? The test is increasing, whereas the training is still going down. So it really depends on what your data is, how separable is it, what's its margin, um, and it, and what kind of weak learners you are using. So in this case, I guess the complexity of the weak learners was fixed. But for some data sets, they naturally have a very small margin, which means your data set how accurately, how close, say, points from two different classes are. And for some of them, you did see that there would increase. But for the others, the margin was good. And so your test error also kept going down. So these were more examples. So there were some examples where it would overfit. But in many of them, it still does pretty well. So this sort of analysis gave uh, some insight into why that might be happening. All right, so I guess that, that was all. We've already talked about, uh, yeah. We talked about the algorithm. We saw, got some insight into what kind of loss function it's optimizing and how, based on that loss function, you can get some of the settings of that algorithm and why it might be a little bit robust to overfitting. All right, so with that, we'll start with graphical models. So questions? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, I guess SVMs are older. That's one reason. <laughs> and uh, really? But they were more or less contemporaneous. So I, mean, I thought boosting was like 90s, right? And SVMs is much much older. That's my impression. Well, I I guess it's, it depends. <laughs> I think so my my so so boosting is very useful for a certain type of data set um, and it's a data set where you can get very good performance and it's also um, like if you have certain types of noise boosting can perform quite poorly and so that's I think um, so yeah, for example, outliers and hosting has some issues because it's focusing on the hardest examples by re them, uh, re the hardest examples. So sometimes if you have outliers, I think you can get uh, stuck on those, trying right. to classify those. So yeah, actually, yeah, that might be. Right. Um, the other thing is that boosting can make, uh, if you boost a thousand rounds of some classifier that takes a while to evaluate, then you get something that's um, computationally difficult to use. Right. Right. And and well, SVMs are not the fastest thing in the world, um, <laughs> but they are. Um, yeah. So basically, it's a trade-off, right? So I think boosting is. Um, I mean, it's not unpopular, right? But it winds up. Um, there are other methods of ensembling classifiers as well that people sometimes use instead of boosting or in addition to boosting. Mm 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, part of the reason that we're um, teaching it, right, is that, I th is that I think it should be part of everybody's toolkit. It can, you know, if you use it under the right circumstances, it can really, really help the classifier that you get. And I think also part of the difference or bias, uh, this has to be between, like, people prefer simple classifiers. SEM is, SEM is at least, like, you know, with a linear classifier, that's the simplest way to use, whereas mm -hmm. this thing tends to be by nature. Right. Like yeah. And, and you know, you could do boosting of linear SVMs yeah. if you wanted to, right? So it's not mutually exclusive. So, okay, so one more thing I wanted to say actually about boosting. Um, the margin interpretation, right? So the, the error is like e to the minus yif of xi, right? And so the Heaviest weight is going to go on examples that where yi f of xi is the smallest, right? Because the exponential function grows very quickly. And so if, you're, if your example has good margin, it's over here. yi f of xi is very positive. If it has bad margin, it's over here. yi f of xi is very negative. And so you're going to get the heaviest weight on the, on the examples with bad margin. And so that's why boosting is going to improve the margin very rapidly, right? All right, and now for something completely different. Um, so let's move to uh, graphical models. So um, what is a graphical model? Uh, a graphical model, it's many things to many people, I guess. Uh, but one way to think about it is it's a way to help you reason about a lot of different random variables at once. So if you imagine, uh, suppose you're a bank. Um, and suppose that you have a bunch of loan customers and you've measured a whole bunch of features about each one of them. Uh, and uh, if you go and you spend 10 minutes thinking about what those features are, you can get a very large number of them, right? So this is like, you know, five minutes worth of thinking of possible features and I'm sure you could double or, or uh, you know, get hundreds of these if you wanted, right? Uh, and let's say you want to predict one of these features from all of the other ones. Let's say uh, you might want to predict whether your customer is going to repay the loan, uh, just to pick one at random, right? Uh, so that's the sort of inference question you might want to, you might be very concerned about if you're a bank. Uh, and you might have some pretty complicated prior knowledge, right? You might have been in the banking business for many years and you might have a lot of intuition about, for example, which one of these variables influences which ones of these other variables directly and which ones only influence through a chain uh, of, of, of influences. So for example, um, uh, you know, your age might influence your earnings. More seniority means more pay or something like that. Um, and then your earnings might uh, influence how expensive a car you own, uh, but your age probably doesn't directly influence it, uh, except maybe through, I don't know, midlife crisis or something like that, right? So you can come up with complicated stories, right, about which uh, variables potentially influence which other ones and how, and you're gonna get some, uh, you know, sparse graph of uh, dependences between the variables and you want to use that somehow to help you do your, uh, help you do your reasoning. All right. So that makes sense? All right. So um, you've already seen uh, a very nice graphical model. Uh, it's called Naive Bayes. And so I'm going to start with Naive Bayes and um, show you how it makes sense to think of it as a graphical model. So naive Bayes, right, we had, um, so we have a whole bunch of examples, right, where we have, you know, uh, customer one, customer two, so forth, right, and each customer has some features which we'll call uh, x1, x, uh, sorry, uh, we can't use x for both those. Let's call them, um, let's call them uh, customer one, two, three, Four, and then we have uh, x, uh, x1 is the first customer, and let's say the zeroth attribute is the one we want to predict, like let's say whether they repaid the loan or not, right? And so that'll be true, true, false, true, right? And then there'll be another feature, uh, x11, right, which is, uh, you know, are they, are they old or not, right? Something like that. And then x12, right? Um, 
And then here, this is uh, right here. We have x two zero, x two one, uh, x two two, right? And we can fill out this matrix uh, by adding more customers and more features of each customer, right? And um, our model, right, is that um, the probability of uh, our entire customer, we'll call them uh, xi, uh, given the model, right, that should be equal to um, pro uh, the probability of the first attribute, given the model, right, times then uh, the probability of the second attribute, xi1, given the first attribute and the model, right, and so forth, right? So the first feature, we just have a probability that the feature is turned on or off. And then the second feature and the third feature and so forth, we have the probability of that feature being turned on or off conditioned on different possible values of the first feature, right? That should be familiar. That's the naive Bayes uh, model, right? That we spend a lot of time on earlier in the course. Okay, and uh, in the end, right, we were able, um, I'm not going to go through the math again, but we were able to come up with algorithms for doing learning and inference, right, learning of the model meaning figure out, figuring out what are these conditional probability distributions, and inference meaning classifying new customers, uh, and we were able to do that using fairly simple formulas because of this uh, independence assumption that we made, right? And so what, um, what I'm going to do, right, is so we have this description, this factorization of the likelihood function. And I'm going to write that in a graphical form. So we have the first uh, attribute, which would be uh, xi0, right? And then we have all of these other attributes, xi1, xi2, xi3, and so forth. Right, and uh, each one of the uh, xi1, xi2, and so forth depends on uh, xi0, meaning that its probability of being true or false is conditioned on xi0, right? xi0 doesn't depend on anything directly, right? It's not, its probability of being true or false is not conditioned on anything. And so what I've done here is I've drawn a graph where there's a node for each variable, and I've put a directed edge when we're conditioning one variable on another variable, right? So this notation makes sense, right? And you can see that this notation refers to the naive Bayes model, right? Every attribute uh, is, depends only on the class attribute, right? And not directly on any of the others, okay? So this is a very um, sort of informal idea of what it means to be a graphical model. Um, let's give one more informal idea before we go to a more formal uh, representation. So I could, have, um, I, I could have my naive Bayes classifier for the banking customers. I could also write a rule-based system, right? So somebody could say that, let's say, you know, uh, old men have high salaries, right? And people with high salaries who don't have many other payments tend to pay off their loans, right? So this is a very simple, probably not very accurate rule-based system, but you get the idea, right? And so I can draw um, a graph again that describes how these variables interact with one another, right? So I can have, for example, uh, the um, age and the uh, whether the uh, customer is male or not, and their salary, right? Uh, and then these are all uh, linked. I'm going to draw a small square node to correspond to the rule and say that all of those are linked by having a rule that refers to all of them, right? And then the same thing, salary and other payments and whether they repay the loan, there's a rule that links all of those together, right? And so again, I've drawn a graph where the nodes are uh, two kinds of nodes now. There's one kind of node for the variables uh, and one kind of node for the rules. And I've connected the nodes when the rule refers to the variable, right? And so again, this is a different type of graphical model, right? The interpretation of the graph is different. But I've gone and 
taken information about the model that I want to use and I've put it in a graphical form. And it's actually much easier if you just look at the graph to see, for example, that uh, age and salary are directly connected, but age and repayment are not directly connected, right? Whereas you could, you know, I mean, there's only two rules here, so you could read them and figure that out. But you could imagine if the graph were a lot bigger, it would be much easier to follow what depended on what from the graph than it would be from the rules. All right. So, um, so what is a graphical model? Um, it's a tool to. Uh, there's a bunch of different. It's a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. One of the things it is is a tool to organize and keep track of lots and lots of applications of Bayes' rule. Uh, so we're talking, you know, millions or perhaps even trillions of applications of Bayes' rule where it's a pain to write down by hand exactly what applications of Bayes' rule you need to do, but you can use a graphical model to help you keep track of them and have a computer do them all for you. Um, you can also think of it as a way to communicate um, properties of a complicated probability distribution, right? So if you have dozens or hundreds or thousands of variables and you have a probability distribution over all of them, you could hand somebody a piece of computer code that implemented that probability distribution and they'd be like, you know, thank you very much, uh, what does that mean, right? Or you could communicate properties of that distribution to them using pictures, right? And the pictures are hopefully easier to understand. Uh, another thing that a, that a graphical model is, it's a way to reason about uh, what variables are dependent or independent of another, uh, possibly conditioned on some third variable. Um, and again, if you have hundreds of random variables, it's difficult to keep track of which ones are conditionally independent, but a graphical model can help you do it in an automated way. Um, and then finally, if you have a big complicated model, it's a way to organize the model itself. You can write down the model so that its parameters correspond to bits of graphical structure, and it makes it easier to think about the model. All right? So that's a lot of things for one little graph to be able to do. Uh, and so hopefully over the, the next uh, couple of lectures, we'll be able to convince you that, uh, in fact, it really is worth your time to take a model and turn it into a graph to help you reason about it. Um, you've already seen a bunch of graphical models. So naive Bayes is one. We showed you that. Uh, li linear regression, logistic regression. Um, turns out that clustering is. Uh, hidden Markov models, if you've seen those. Kalman filters, right? The list, the list goes on. It's one of the most common ways that people use to help write down uh, a model that they're going to, a complicated statistical model that they're going to do inference in. Uh, and for a while, like if you went to ICML, like every third paper would have a graphical model diagram, you know, in figure two up in the, you know, corner of the second page. Yeah. Have you learned something in this class that's not a graphical model? Um, <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> So um, decision trees are, in some sense, orthogonal to being a graphical model. So they're, uh, they're graphical structure that's not a graphical model of this type, right? So you can think of them, um, actually, maybe we should revisit what the relationship is after we say what graphical models are, because I'm going to I'm going to only be able to give a vague answer about what the, um, what the, what the relationship is. Um, Non-probabilistic models also don't directly fit into graphical models. Um, so for example, a perceptron, which we derived by empirical risk minimization, that's not directly interpretable as a graphical model. But yeah, given this list, right, it's a good question. Is there anything that isn't a graphical model? Uh, there are some researchers who would say no. If you're thinking of something that isn't a graphical model, then you're not thinking precisely. Um, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Yeah, all non-parametric. Well, but you can have non-parametric estimation of things within a graphical model, right? So again, it's, it's an orthogonal technique rather than a... Uh, yeah, but you want, yeah, you don't call that as a graph. I mean, you can... You're right. Find, right, yeah. right you, can, you can combine it. Yeah. I think a lot of like diehard Bayesians might even say that non-parametrics are um, a little bit questionable. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, right, so there is non-parametric Bayes, right? So you can assort this in all, all sorts of different ways. So I saw there's a question up there. Yeah, you mentioned uh, perception is not a graphical model. Mm -hmm. 
So you can make a bolt, right, so Perceptron is a specific algorithm for training a linear separator, and you can make other algorithms for training linear separators that are graphical models. So for example, logistic regression would be one, the Boltzmann machine would be another. So I saw, did I see other hands as well? All right, cool. So now that, now that graphical models are everywhere, we should try, um, well, okay, so, All right, so yeah, just a couple more slides about why graphical models are cool. Um, so um, all of the examples on the previous slide were examples of graphical models. You might ask, why learn about general graphical models rather than some specific example that I might need to use? Um, and so the, there are a few different reasons. One of them is, um, representation and handling of uncertainty. So one of the strengths of graphical models is, is the ability to represent complicated patterns of dependence and of uncertainty. And so if you need to reason about complicated patterns of dependence and uncertainty, graphical models are the tool. Um, another is for interpretability, right? So I, uh, I mentioned before that like a graph is easier to understand than a piece of computer code that implements a probability distribution. Um, that gets to be more and more true the more complicated your probability distribution is. Um, and then the final one is to manage complexity. So um, there's a bunch of different types of complexity you could think about. Uh, for example, um, you know, I gave uh, a rule-based system as an example, and if the rules are always true, then you might as well use a rule-based system. But if you have rules that are mostly true, right, like birds tend to fly except that penguins don't fly, except that super penguin flies, right? Um, <laughs> so if you have, you know, rules with exceptions and you're, you know, you're not sure sort of, you know, if some of the rules apply, right, like there's five different rules that, that could potentially apply, you might be an exception to three of them. How do you integrate all of that uncertainty together to come up with a concrete prediction, right? So that's one kind of complexity. Um, another kind of complexity is prior information. So if you go to an expert in any given domain, you know, uh, medicine or material science or astronomy, they've got a ton of information in their head, right? And uh, often you're stuck, so sometimes you're in the situ situation where you can collect a pile of data and the data tells you everything that you need to know, right? Um, and then in that situation, that's great, but a lot of the time you need, uh, in order to be able to make uh, meaningful inferences, you need to get uh, a lot of information out of the expert. And the expert needs to be able to express this information in a form that your statistical model can then take in. And graphical models are actually a pretty decent way of doing that. So um, people are actually pretty comfortable drawing little graphs with circles and arrows on them that say, you know, this variable is influenced by this other one. And uh, you can get a lot of useful information out of a domain expert by asking them to tell you what depends on what and how strongly and approximately like what, you know, what's the sign of the dependence or what's the, um, uh, you know, what's the vague functional form that the dependence might take. Um, another, another sort of complexity would be um, uh, missing data, right? So if, the miss if data is missing and the mechanism which makes it missing is not simple, right? You might actually need to reason about what are the things that influence whether you see a particular data point or not. So that's a good example of a complex model. Um, Another one is we might not know ahead of time the questions we need to answer, right? Somebody comes and dumps on us, you know, 100 gigabytes of banking data and says, build a model, and I'm gonna come back next week and start asking you questions about the model, right? So what do you wanna do? You don't wanna just learn a linear regression because you might learn a linear regression to predict something that, you know, they care about today but don't care about next week, right? So, all of these different kinds of complexity uh, tend, to, tend to indicate graphical models. Now, the other alternative to a graphical model would be learning the full joint distribution of the data, right? So you could, instead of having some simple representation, you know, some, some, you know, I guess complicated graph that tells you how to define a distribution over your data, you could instead just say, 
data is cheap, I'm going to learn a full joint distribution over all of that, right? And the answer to that is just think about uh, 100 binary variables, right? How many parameters do you need to learn the full joint distribution over 100 binary variables? Is it, you know, more than a million? Less than a million? Uh, nobody's willing to vote for much, but I think more than a million ones. It's a lot more than a million, right? It's like, it's two to the 100 minus one parameters, right? That's, that's a ton of parameters. You are never going to see enough data to estimate this many parameters, right? You're not gonna fit it inside your computer. You're not gonna fit it inside your cluster, right? So, so in a lot of cases, learning the full joint distribution is just a non-starter, right? You can't, you can't even afford to touch all of the parameters of your model. And so graphical models sort of sit in a nice place between simple models that make unrealistic assumptions about the data and models that are too flexible, right, and have way too many parameters to ever actually, to ever actually work with them. All right, so after all of this motivation, hopefully everybody is nice and motivated at this point. What is a graphical model? So a graphical model is basically any model that you can write down using a graph which is called the structure of the model, uh, and some numbers, which are the parameters of the model, right? So uh, an example would be that naive Bayes model that we, that we looked at before, right, where we have uh, the graphical structure, right, is this part right here, right? And then the parameters are all of these probability distributions that we learned, right? Uh, like what's the marginal probability of repaying a loan or what's the conditional probability that somebody's age is 26 to 35 given that they repay a loan or given that they don't repay a loan, right? And so um, uh, you'll see a lot of different graphical models over the next lecture or two. And the thing that they all have in common is this sort of division of your model between a graph that represents a structure of your model and then some numbers or uh, you know, other information that is uh, representing the parameters of the model. And typically what will happen is that the nodes in your model will refer to things like random variables. Um, the edges will refer to things like whether there's a direct or indirect dependence or what type of dependence. Uh, and then the parameters will be attached to bits of graphical structure, to the nodes or the edges in the model. Uh, and it's that, uh, it's that association of parameters to structure that's going to help you keep track of a large number of parameters and estimate them simply from lots of data. All right. So we've seen uh, a couple of simple examples. Um, before we get into the more complicated ones, let me say sort of what, what are the questions we're going to be asking about all of the different uh, types of graphical model. So there are basically three key questions that I could um, think about asking for a graphical model. One is what I'll call inference. So um, here you're given the structure of the model and you're given the parameters of the model. And what you're uh, asked is to answer some, uh, some queries. So an example of a query would be, uh, what is the probability that the uh, salary is low uh, and um, the customer repays the loan uh, given uh, that uh, age is equal to high? Right? So you could ask some question about conditioning on some of the variables, marginalizing over some other variables, what's the probability distribution of a last set of variables, right? So this sort of, uh, this sort of query is called an inference in a graphical model, and it's the most basic question. It's the one that we're going to spend the most time answering. Uh, another question is uh, given now the structure of the model, Right? So the expert might be able to tell you the structure, but experts are typically bad at writing down, uh, you know, the conditional probability of A given B is 0.37254, 
right? They'll, they'll say, eh, it's, you know, a third or so, who knows, right? They'll give you a prior over what it might be, but they won't be able to write it down exactly. So instead of, instead of having the parameters, you'll just have some data, right? And then you're going to want to learn the parameters. Right? And then the, the point of that, right, is that once you've done learning, uh, it feeds into this inference question that you'll be able to answer queries about the model later after you've, you've, uh, after you've uh, learned the model. Right? And then the last one um, is suppose that you don't have a handy expert around to tell you the structure and you just have data. Right? Then uh, you want to learn the structure and the parameters. And this is the one we're going to say the least about. And the reason we're going to say the least about it is that it is uh, unfortunately rather hard. Um, not because it's not a useful thing to do, but because there's not all that much uh, that I want to say about it at the level of an introductory course in machine learning. Um, Basically, uh, it's a big combinatorial search problem, and there are a lot of heuristics that people have designed for it. Uh, and we have an entire course on graphical models uh, where basically you know, we'll spend a whole lot of time discussing what the algorithms are for, for doing structure learning, among other questions. Um, in all of these things, one of the core computational questions that um, Right, so these are the high level questions that we want to answer. And they're going to turn into a bunch of computer code that we write to answer these questions. And the thing that makes this computer code run slowly uh, is going to be big sums, right? So if you think about, um, right, here's a probability distribution over five variables. And suppose we want to know the marginal distribution over two of them. Well, we have to sum out three of them. Right? And so here, with five variables that are binary, there's 2 to the 5 is 32 different possible settings. And we want to sum over uh, 2 to the 3 is 8 settings to get each entry of this uh, uh, probability table. Right? And so that's not so big. But if you think about, again, two to, uh, you know, 100 variables, 2 to the 100 possible settings, and we want to marginalize out 97 of them, um, then, you, then you're starting to talk about real computer time. Right? And so um, the main thing that we're going to wind up doing then uh, is writing, is coming up with strategies to make these uh, huge summations more tractable to do, right? And so we're going to dive into the details of doing that, but keep in your head while we're doing that, that what we want to do in the end are these questions like inference learning and structure learning, right? And the, these sums are going to wind up being useful uh, in particular for inference. All right. Um, um, the past, uh, I guess, uh, 11 slides, um, what should you know? You should know what is a graphical model. Uh, and some, uh, you should be able to give a couple of examples of things that are graphical models. Why should you choose graphical models, either compared to special cases or generalizations of them? Um, and uh, basically, that the key questions that we're going to be doing, so first, that a graphical model divides into its structure and its parameters, um, and that the key questions we're going to be doing are inference learning and structure learning to varying degrees of detail in this course. All right, so um, let's see if we can solve a simple inference task with a simple graphical model. Um, we should maybe just have time to do this in the remainder of the lecture. Uh, and that'll give you a flavor of the sort of computations we're going to be doing. Uh, and then we'll return to more complicated inference tasks and more complicated graphical models next time around. So, okay, here's our, here's our graphical model, right? We had our, um, well, here's our statistical model. It's a rule-based system, right? I just wrote it down with a single let letter per variable um, instead of the full words to make it more compact. Um, and suppose that we want to know, so there are five variables, 32 possible settings. Suppose we want to know how many of those possible settings satisfy both of these rules, okay? So that's an, that's an, interesting, um, an interesting question. So one thing that we could do uh, is we could make um, just, we'll call this a predicate, 
a predicate just means a, a zero one valued function, right? Uh, and we'll call it p. And what we could do is we could ask what is the sum over all values of a, uh, m, o, s, and r, p of a, m, o, s, r, right? So we could just enumerate all 32 values and we could uh, evaluate the predicate enumerate all 32 settings of the variables, evaluate the predicate on each setting, and sum, right? And again, because this is a small example, uh, we can do that. But um, because we want to do large examples as well, let's see if we can be a little bit smarter, right? So um, one thing that we can do uh, is we can say, well, um, P of A, M, O, S, and R, that's actually not, um, an indivisible atomic thing, right? We have some information about the predicate. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it as a product, F of uh, A, M, and S times G of uh, S, O, and R, right? So, um, right, and so what, what does that mean, right? So I'm, I'm uh, going to call this guy, I'll call him F, Right? And this guy here, I'll call him G. And I've made two predicates, F and G, one for each one of the rules. And then I've anded them together by multiplying their outputs. Right? So one times one is one, but one times anything else is zero. Right? And zero time, one times zero is zero, and zero times zero is zero. Right? So multiplication Im uh, uh, implements and. And so what have I done? Right? I've, um, I've factored the predicate into two terms, and I can think of that as being a representation of my graphical model, right? I have my uh, F term and my G term, uh, and the variable S participates in both of them, right? Uh, right, and I've made a graph here. And there are two types of nodes. There are predicates, which I'm giving as squares, and there are variables, which I'm giving as circles, all right? So now what can we do with this, um, right? So uh, here, right, I just redrew that same graph. Um, and here's the, uh, right, this is P here. Uh, right, I guess this is not P, but the sum of P. And um, what do I want to do if I want to calculate this efficiently? Well, so let's, um, let's think about the sum over, uh, let's say, O, right? So I have uh, sum over A, M, S, O, and R of that product, right? But O only appears in the G term. So I can take the sum and I can move it inward, right? And so I can get, um, right, the sum of P is equal to, right, this is the sum over A, M, O, S, and R. Uh, sum over A, M, uh, S, and R, and I'll take the sum over O, right, this is F of A, M, and S, and then I'll take the sum over O and I can move it in as far as that, right? So that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, right? So for uh, shorthand, right, what I've done is I've written the, uh, I haven't written like five different summations, right, the subscript, the multiple, I'm writing a multiple sub, uh, summation using multiple subscripts on one sum symbol. That's okay with everybody? Okay. And so I've taken the sum over O and I've moved it in as far as I can. Now, uh, why stop there, right? There's, um, F doesn't have an R in it as, uh, either. And so that's also equal to the sum over A, M, and S, F of A, M, S. Uh, sum over O and sum over R, G of O, S, and R, right? And so um, what I can do then is this summation, right? I can uh, do that summation, uh, you know, numerically, right? So G is now a table with eight rows in it, right? So if I look at, for example, right, this is G here, this is F here. So if I write out G, right, um, the only thing that makes it false, right, the only thing that makes an implication false is if we have um, this true, S true, 
O false and R false. So that's true, false, false, right? That'll be zero, and then everything else will be one, right? The only thing that makes an implication false is if both of its um, premises are true, but the conclusion is not true, right? Um, and so I can do this summation over uh, O and R, right, which are the first and third arguments. And so um, if I do that summation, I'll get, I'll call this, right, a new function, uh, H, and H is going to have S as an argument, right? O and R will be summed out, but S will, is still free in that, and so it'll be an argument, and it will be either um, four or three, depending on whether S is true or false. Right? So I've made, um, uh, so that's, that's kind of useful, right? So I've, I've uh, looked only at a table with eight rows instead of a table with 32 rows, and I've done some computation, and I've made some progress at solving the problem, and I never had to touch the full joint distribution of all of the variables. Um, so we're summing over, uh, so let's see, when S is true, right, that's going to be um, this, this, and this, and this element of the table, right, and the sum of those is 4, and when S is false, it'll be, right, this, 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 and this, and the sum of those is 3, right? So that's the second argument, whether it's true or false, right? Okay, so I've, uh, um, right, and I can write down, um, I can do the same thing for the F table, right? So the only way to make the F table false is for both of the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. All of the rest of them will be one, right? Uh, and now, uh, what do I have, right? So I have, this is equal to the sum over A, M, and S of F of A, M, S, H of S, right? Where H is this new table right here, right? And so now, um, I, there's only three variables left, right? So I can make a table of all three, uh, all eight um, uh, outputs of that, um, uh, of that table, all eight values of that table. Uh, and so I'll do that on the next slide. Right, so we had, this is our H potential, our H table from uh, the previous slide. And so if I make F times H, right, so uh, S is the last argument of F, right? So uh, H is going to be um, 3, 4, whoops, I think I, did I get it backwards? Yeah, H was 4 for true and 3 for false. Sorry about that. 4, 3, and so this should be uh, 4, 3, 4, 3, uh, 4, 3, 4, 3, and then F times H will be 4, 0, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, and if we sum that, uh, you know, you can all get out your calculators or you can believe me that the answer is 25, right? So the sum here is 25. And so now I've got the answer to this question, right? Uh, the answer to how many uh, satisfying assignments there are for this, pair, for this pair of clauses, right? And I only ever dealt with tables that were of size eight or smaller, right? I dealt with the F table and the G table that were size eight, and the H table that was size two, and then the F times H table that was size eight, right? And so for this, um, particular example that's small enough to put on a slide, the savings are kind of small, right? But again, if you think of 100 binary variables um, and suppose that, you know, you're able to get away with no more than, let's say, five arguments to any one of your tables, right? You're going to wind up with, you know, a few hundreds of arithmetic operations as opposed to two to the hundred arithmetic operations. And I can tell you which one of those things I would prefer. So um, I think
that's probably where we should stop for today. Um, we'll continue next time with how to take this idea and do more complicated inference questions with it.